Now, I have two comments as an economist. I'm always intrigued when I circulate, which I occasionally do in the in the one percent, and I discover that a good bit of their wealth is used to escape the very pollution that their money mm -hmm. creates. They live in special houses with filtered air and filtered water. In other words, they themselves live out the need to escape what they are doing to the world. It, it, there's an irony and an absurdity here that you would need a more theatrically equipped person than me to, to capture. Right. And the other one is, you know, in the logic of capitalism, it makes perfect sense. If you're a company that wants to make a lot of profit off of a product, you've got to do the best you can to make that product look good, to squelch people who suggest the product isn't good. That's just the logic of how business works, right. which is why, in a sense, you're reporting on the net outcome of the successful effort of these corporations to do what corporations right. Do. Tell us a little bit, as you were saying you were going to, about how the environmental movement struggled with a more or less systemic approach or critique. Right. Well, it's obvious that we're not going to get the environmental reforms we want with the deck stacked against us. But environmental groups arose because of what was happening to the world. And really, we should have morphed into an anti-capitalist movement. We really should have gone in that direction. But what we've got instead is what a lot of people call the nonprofit industrial complex. <laughs> and this is part of the whole trying to figure out why we're losing our battle for the earth, why we're not going to survive as a species, is understanding how we've been fighting. And there's always been this dynamic in the nonprofit groups that I worked with where you end up, you end up building your organization instead of building a movement because you know, you're in competition with other groups for funding and attention. But that has gotten that whole dynamic of not examining what we're up against and not having tactics and strategies that are based on that and then get us beyond capitalism, it's gotten worse because for the last 30 years there's been pressure for nonprofit groups to think of themselves as businesses, to operate as businesses, to have brands and other things like that. Right. So it's getting worse and worse. and. Um, we have to understand that the whole world of environmental groups is shaped by the very big money forces that are creating the environmental problems that we're, we're dealing with. So a, a lot of environmental groups, they get their funding primarily from big foundations and major donors. So who are those people? Those are people that have done really well under capitalism. And for the most part, they are not funding anybody who identifies capitalism as a problem or will rock that boat. And you talked about you know rich people getting away from pollution. Um, there's a whole dynamic. If you look at any environmental issue that's facing the planet, you go down to the source. You know where's it happening? Where are the pesticides being released to the environment? Where are the, the chemicals being manufactured? Where are we mining the fossil fuels? You will almost always find a low-income community, and usually it's a community of color. These are called environmental justice communities because of the injustice they have. So in a rational world. These would be the groups that would be in the driver's seat in the environmental movement. They're suffering the biggest damages. They'll be able to recognize what's a real solution and what's a Band-Aid. But they get, the environmental justice groups get about 4% of the environmental foundation world's funding every year. You know, the groups that get the money are big groups that are not dealing with those issues, not led by those groups. And we have to, we have to deal with that and, and recognize that working within the nonprofit industrial complex as it now exists, uh, many of us are getting diverted into dead ends instead of using our energy for what we should be using it for. All right, your very comments lead to the next question. What are the prospects, in your judgment, for a reorientation of the environmental movement to confront capitalism, to say that to solve the environmental problems we need to be part of a movement that changes the economic system so we have a different system, mm -hmm. different way of organizing production and distribution of goods and services that will be more likely, at least, to take seriously the saving of the earth right. than the capitalism we live with, as you have shown, doesn't do that. Right. The trajectory that I've been on is one that a whole lot of people within environmental groups and people who don't align themselves with environmental groups um, are on this trajectory. 
I think that more and more people are realizing that we need systemic change and what, what that means. I think a lot of it is under the surface. We've only made baby steps forward so far that are visible, but under the surface, people I talk to within the environmental movement are, are devastated by the reality that they, they can't hide from anymore, that we're going to go down as a species. We're not going to have justice. We're not going to even have survival. So people are grasping that. And, and that having, I personally have a yeah. lot more hope than, than I did. We need to be organizing an e economic democracy agenda, a movement. And some people, when I tell them about the book, and I, they just hear the first part, you know, we're losing, it's documented, yeah. we're uh, up against this really big multi-tentacled beast, and we're not fighting effectively. People say, isn't that a recipe for despair? But actually, it's not at all. I was feeling despair, and people feel despair when we pretend we're winning and we know we're not, or we don't understand what's going on. And when you face into things, the path forward is quite obvious, as is our power. And if we, if we do what we should be doing, which is talk like we're doing right here, and talk everywhere about what we're actually up against and a vision of the alternative. There is an alternative way to organize things. We also see that we have the power because we are the 99%. Right. You know, we turn the wheels of society and when we're on the same page, when we don't get diverted into these dead ends, we can rapidly turn things around. And, and there are solutions for all of the world's environmental problems. They're sitting there waiting to be implemented. You know, we have the renewable technology we have. We have sustainable agriculture te alternatives. It's sitting there. And I think people are searching, and I think we are gradually, uh, as individuals, becoming aware of the need to change how we're thinking. And I think we're going to take that leap as a movement quite soon. I was struck in your book that it was, in fact, very smooth how you showed the reader time and again that a good initiative, a good objective, was being stymied by a corporation that was doing what corporations do, trying to make money and shape the environment to be a profitable enterprise. So that as you went through it, I thought it was very effective how you were teaching your reader the very things you've come to understand yourself, which is what a good book does. You. Save them the time because you've kind of done the experience and done the writing up of the experience so that they can see that if you care about the environment, then being a fighter for a fundamental economic change is a corollary. It's as logical for the pro-environmental person to be anti-capitalist as it is logical for the capitalist to be anti-environmentalist mm -hmm. in those industries where their their profits depend on muddying all the water and muddying all the right. comprehension and sending all the groups that they feel threatened right. by off into the things you call dead ends. Right. And, you know, the, the water is muddied. And when you're in there, in the trenches and you're fighting, it's it's easy to be confused. But when you step back, and that's what I try to do with the book, and you look at the big picture, it's pretty clear. And the thing is, even though the waters are muddied, people are beginning to you see. It? You know, you can only hide it so long. And so you have, you know, things you've talked about on the show where, you know, big percentages of young people and even people who are not very young are now talking about socialism and would mm -hmm. vote for a socialist candidate. You know, despite the taboo and everything that has been done to prevent that conversation, you know, people are talking about that stuff. Right. People are independent, not Democrat or Republican. And um, there's just a, a, we're at this do or die point. We really are. But people are out there fighting for justice, not just on the environment, but on all these other interrelated issues and doing amazing work, amazing work. Can you and, um, people, give us a couple of examples that maybe come to your mind that people... Well. You know, the farm worker community that, that I worked with, you know, we're told time and again, well, drift isn't a problem. So, you know, people got air monitors and got scientific training and set up the monitors and proved what everybody knew, which was pesticides were drifting. You know, people are doing... In, in the it, air and in the wind. In, in the wind coming, coming from plants onto children playing at daycares. You know, that's just one example of all the extraordinary things people do. And when we... All of us start talking with each other about how this is all great, we need to keep trying those things, but 
you know, that brick wall we keep running into over mm -hmm. and over again, it's a brick wall. Yeah. And, and we need to take that wall down. We need to get beyond capitalism to an economic system that is compatible with democracy. Because basically, we don't have democracy. We don't have any influence over these decisions that affect humanity's fate. And we need to just stop being diverted into the dead ends by false friends. We really, we really do have the power to change things if we, if we acknowledge that and start using that power. And that's what I talk about in the book. Do you have a comment on the Republican and Democratic parties? Have they been, and I don't mean one or the other, I mean sort of both mm -hmm. of them. as right. the, Because we, you know, in our system, we alternate government from one to the other, mm -hmm. sort of like uh, musical chairs. How would you assess the role of the Republican and Democratic parties over the last 30, 40 years since Rachel Carson and all of the consciousness around the environment right. emerged? I think we have been getting further and further away from uh, both parties are getting further and further away from representing the interests of the 99%. Both are heavily funded by the 1%, and both have agendas that reinforce capitalism. And I think with the Democrats, you get more of the rhetoric of, oh, yes, we really care about the environment. But as I gave with the example with um, President Obama and what's happening on global warming, the rhetoric is not matched by action. They, they, the Democratic Party, just like the Republican parties, are serving a few corporate interests, including the corporations that are destroying our planet. And in terms of the, the current electoral scene, it's very interesting and encouraging, I think, that so many people are rallying behind someone who calls himself a socialist, whether he is or not. And I believe on the Republican side that a lot of people that are rallying around Trump are doing so because they feel so dis disgusted with our system and they're so abused by it. So I think you know what's happening in this bizarre electoral season is we're seeing people want real change. And you don't get that by rallying behind candidates and voting every four years. You get it by organizing for economic democracy. And you certainly don't get it with Democrats or Republicans. Ultimately, we need an independent working people's political party. And, but that's part of this bigger thing of let's step back together in workplaces, unions, civic organizations, environmental groups, programs like this, and let's say, let's see, what are we actually up against? And, and it's not, you know, money in, in politics. That's a symptom. That's a symptom of how the economy is set up. Let's see what we're actually up against. Let's envision an economic system based on democracy, and let's acknowledge our power and stop wasting it.